Thank you, Pam. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to the New Testament book of Colossians? We're beginning a new study uh, today. Um, you have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. And so it's about midway somewhere there in the New Testament, toward the back of the Bible, four chapter book, the book of Colossians. As you're turning there, as many of you know, uh, Karen officially retired uh, from her work at the Pregnancy Support Center on uh, Thursday. I was sharing Thursday night at the uh, dinner that I'm both uh, excited and nervous. I'm excited because I'm glad she's retired, um, but I'm a little nervous because she'll be around me more and she may realize, who did I marry, you know? But anyway, it's very exciting. But I decided a few weeks ago um, before she left to visit her mom that I wanted to do something special, not in a big scale, but in a small scale. And uh, so um, I decided to get what would be a uh, sort of a care package or uh, gifts that would be appropriate for someone who was retired. You might call it a, a, a retired person survival kit. So I purchased a beautiful mug that had these uh, decorative uh, birds on it. They really look nice. And I knew she likes decaffeinated coffee. She likes the soft coffee. So I bought these decaf coffee pods, a uh, thousand piece puzzle, a girly Christian novel, uh, a journal, all of these things that I thought now that she's retired, she could uh, pour over. And it blessed me to see she's already using the mug and the coffee. I'm sure she will use the other things in the coming months. But you know, today we're beginning uh, a study in the book of Colossians. And this study will be in it uh, December and beyond. And we're going to look at a number of things in these weeks together. But this morning, I want to begin by focusing on the things that God gives us, the essential things that he gives us in this season of our life in ministry. That you can know right now, whatever God has called you to do, he is going to give you what you need to be able to do that in the Christian life. Look with me at Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 14. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope and the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learn this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully giving thanks to the father who has enabled you to share in the saints inheritance in the light he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves in him we have redemption the forgiveness of sins let's pray father as we open this study in the book of Colossians, we pray this hour that you would speak, that, Father, we know that your burden is easy, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And, Father, as those of us who have followed you as Lord and Savior, uh, Lord, you give us commands, you give us responsibilities. But, Lord, you don't leave us on our own to do those things, but you equip us with all that we need in order to be what you have called us to be. So speak in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I, I do want to look at these essential provisions, but uh, as we do often when we enter a new study in the book, it's important that we look at some of the background information about the book itself, because we're going to be in it 
uh, the study of it for a number of weeks. First is who wrote this epistle. It's very simple for us to understand that. In the very first verse, in the la very last verse of this epistle, it says that the apostle Paul wrote this book or this epistle. Now, to whom was it written? We know also that in, in uh, verse 2, it says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae. Now, Colossae was a city that is located in what is now modern-day Turkey. I was thinking this past week as I was reading about the background information of the city, it sort of reminded me of Gladstone, Virginia. Maybe you're familiar with Gladstone. If you go there today, it's sort of a, a ghost type of town. But there was a day uh, when the railroads were primarily coming through that area. It was a depot, and it was a very busy place. So there was a season when Colossae was was very strategically located. It was a central trade route. However, the time of Paul's writing, not so much so, yet it was still important. It was predominantly the city made up of, of Gentiles, although uh, some historians say that at the time of Paul's writing, there were about 50,000 Jews in and around the region of Colossae. Laodicea, that infamous church uh, mentioned in the uh, book of Revelation that is lukewarm, was located about 10 miles from Colossae, and we'll see that that city is mentioned uh, here earlier, of course, than uh, John's revelation. And also the city of Hierapolis, which was a popular city, was located. Now, the church itself, again, was predominantly Gentile in makeup, and it was not started by the Apostle Paul. And we'll read today and in other places about this man, Epaphras, who is very significant in the work and the ministry of the church there. So Paul wrote it. He wrote to the church at uh, Corinth, I mean uh, Colossae. And why was it written? Well, the book's about four chapters in length. The first two chapters deal primarily with doctrinal matters. The, the last two chapters deal primarily with practical matters. And so as we look through it in the first two chapters, he addresses heresies uh, that existed, the threat of things. He established some uh, spiritual truths that are important. And then we see the transition in uh, chapter 3 in verse 1, if I can uh, separate that. It says, so if you've been raised with Christ, chapter 3, verse 1, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So we see that transition in chapter 3. He's saying, okay, all of these things doctrinally are true. So if that's the case, then you need to live in a particular way. So there's the doctrinal, the theological aspect of it in the first half, and then the practical matters that we'll look at in the last two chapters. Now, Paul wrote uh, for really three uh, primary reasons. One was to show concern for the believers in Colossae, even though he himself didn't start the church, he cared about the church there. He, he also warned them about turning back to the things which they had forsaken in order to follow Christ. And then primarily he wrote to address this false teaching that was prevalent in the church there. And we'll be looking at that over the next uh, few weeks. But I want to look today at these first 14 verses, and I want to look at what God gives us to live the Christian life. Now, Karen, in her retirement, the things that I gave her uh, might make her retirement more enjoyable, hopefully maybe more fulfilling. But none of the things that I gave her we would consider to be essential to retirement. You don't have to have a coffee mug to be retired. Some retired people don't even like coffee, believe it or not. I don't understand that. But that's true. But these things that we list today, that we're going to look at today in the Word of God, they're essential to the Christian life. Uh, God um, gives us what we need. Now, before uh, we get to these things that are essential, we might say, okay, what are we to be doing? What does God expect from us? And God includes that here in these verses. And I want to very quickly uh, move through these things, especially toward the back end, uh, verses 9 through 12 of our text. We see some things that are expected of us as Christians. Maybe today you're a new Christian. 
maybe as a result of the Rick Gage crusade this week, you for the first time trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it can be overwhelming. What now? Well, uh, we can see some things that God wants from you. First, he wants you to live a life of gratitude. Notice verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. So we're to have uh, a heart of gratitude. We're to thank God if we have trusted Christ, and many of us have. We can give God thanks that we are in right standing with him. You know, one of the things that's so essential to the Christian life is gratitude. If you think when we lack gratitude, many times that can be a path to other sins. When we lack gratitude for what God has done for us and we begin to get our eyes off of having that heart of appreciation, many times it can lead to covetousness. It can lead to wrong desires. And so we're to live a life of gratitude. The second thing is Christians, we're to live a life that pleases him. Before we accepted Christ, we could live as we wanted to live. Now we want to live in a way that would please him. Look at verse 10 so that you might walk worthy of the Lord. None of us is worthy in and of himself or herself. It's not saying that you have to work your way to a point of worthiness, but we're to walk in a way that is consistent with the Lord. We're not to profess Christ and then our way of life to be different from that, but our way of life is to be different in such a way that we live a life that it says here in verse 10 is fully pleasing to him. Then we see also a third thing. We're to bear fruit for his glory. He has bearing fruit in every good work. I was reading this past week of how Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. And so the key to our fruitfulness in the Christian life is that we stay connected with him. That's why when we accept Christ, it's important to read the Bible. It's important to obey Christ. It's important to pray and all of these things so that we can bear fruit. It's not that we produce the fruit, we yield it. It's God who produces it and we just yield ourselves. And so he desires that we bear fruit. He desires that we grow in our faith. Look at uh, verse 10. It says, so you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work. And then in the latter part of verse 10, growing in the knowledge of God. This is not just some mental uh, awareness, but it is a knowledge that in, allows us to be able to grow uh, in our faith. But not only that, we're to stay the course. Stay the course. Look at verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. In other words, uh, if you have accepted Christ, the Lord wants you to stay the course. That's why if you trusted Christ this past week uh, during the evangelistic crusade, it is so important to stay in the fellowship. It is so important to stay the course. Uh, we saw uh, in our Sunday school lesson today in Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so we participate with the Lord and stay in the course. And then there's one other thing that is essential for us as Christians. We need to love our fellow believers. Verse three, uh, we always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We see the love uh, that um, Paul has for them. But not only that, notice what he says about them in verse four, for we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love you have for all the saints. And so we see as Christians, we're to live a life of gratitude, thanking God for our salvation, his blessings. We're to live a life that is worthy of the Lord, that's pleasing to him. We're to bear fruit for his glory. We're to be witnesses in our, our lives, through our lifestyle, through our words. We're to grow in our faith. Uh, we're to stay the course and we're to love our fellow believers. Now that's a tall order. And I'll tell you right now, in and of our own strength, we will fall. We will fail in this. But the, the thing about it, bearing fruit, being loving, growing, staying thankful, faithful, being pleasing to God, these things God calls us to do, but he enables us to do it through these things we're going to look at today, these resources that he gives us for the Christian life. You know, in the book of Exodus, I was thinking this past week, you may remember this, uh, the people were crying out to God and crying out to Moses because the oppression 
of the Egyptians and the Egyptian rulers seemed to be unbearable. You may remember it. Moses went to Pharaoh and he was telling him to let the people go. And he was saying, the work that you have uh, encumbered these people with, it's, it's unbearable. And, and let up. He was telling Pharaoh to do that. You know what Pharaoh did? He didn't listen to Moses. He said, I want you to do this. I want you to go back to the people and you tell them, I expect the same quota of bricks, only now they have to go secure their own straw. We're not going to provide it. In other words, you think it's tough? We're going to make it harder now. We're going to tell them we expect the same thing and we're going to give them fewer resources. They're going to have to go and find them for yourselves. That was Pharaoh. What does Jesus say? He says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, the Christian life is a challenge. It can be difficult, but it's also very simple because God not only calls us, he equips us. He gives us certain things that we need in the Christian life to live a life worthy of the Lord, to live a life of gratitude, to bear fruit in the Christian life. And he gives us what we need, not for our retirement that we might kick back in the Christian life, but he gives us these things that we might be affected for him. And I want to look at these six things very briefly today. Every one of these is important. The first thing that he gives you, Christian, is this, the prayer and support of fellow believers. Man, what a blessing it was at the crusade this week. 112 people professed Christ for the first time. 112 people in our area. And one of the beauties was knowing that people were praying for people as they were coming forward. Maybe someone saw a sibling, maybe a child, someone saw a family member, a coworker, and as they were coming, uh, that individual was responding to the work of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't just that person who was responding. There were people in the assembly hall and at home who were watching online who were praying for them. And so they weren't alone and they aren't alone. You know, many of you may remember one of the most moving pictures in Olympic history. It happened in 1992 in the Summer Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. There was a man named Derek Redmond who was running the 400 meters, which was one full time around the track. And as he was running, I guess he must have gone about three quarters through the race and he pulled up. If you've ever had a hamstring injury, you know what that is like. You get shot in the back of your leg and so immediately he just fell to the ground and he tried to get up and he couldn't walk and there was pain in his face all of a sudden out of the crowd came a man an older man it was his father that took his son and crossed the finish line with him listen God doesn't leave you in this life called the Christian race to run it alone he gives us not just his presence, but he gives us the prayer and support of other believers. Notice what Paul is saying to the church at Colossae in verse 3. We, not just he, but Timothy, those who are with him, we uh, in number, we're, we thank God and we pray for you. A and he mentions Epaphras in, in verse 7. He said, you have learned this from Epaphras. Our dearly fellow, our dearly loved fellow servant. In other words, he was praying. Paul was praying. Others were praying. Epaphras was investing. The people were not alone. And, and as you live this Christian life that can be faced with challenges, you're not alone. There are others who are here with you. But not only that, he gives us the hope of heaven. That's the second thing. These tools, these things that he gives to us. You know, if Jesus has said in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy that lay before him, Jesus endured the cross. Do you think the cross was easy for Jesus? It wasn't. But it says in Hebrews 12 too, that the joy, the heavenly joy that lay before him, that lay on the horizon beyond the cross, uh, drove him to endure the cross. You know, life may be difficult for you now, but I want you to know this. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the hope of heaven. And hope enables you to endure the present. Hope is future, but it impacts the present. And so here in verse 5, we see that Paul is writing. He said, because of the hope 
reserved for you in heaven. Now, reserved is sort of like what happens when um, the kids and grandkids go to the candy store and, and uh, come back home. They have to hide it from me. So they reserve it, they take it, and they set it aside for future use, hoping that I don't find that candy. Sometimes I do find it. But what do we do? When we reserve something, we set it aside for future benefit. And that's what heaven is. Listen, no matter what you're going through right now, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that your future is bright. And that's what God gives you to encourage you. Kirk Miller is going to be with us next month, the first Saturday and first Sunday of uh, next month. I encourage you, uh, block off that Saturday morning, block off our Sunday school hour which we're going to have United Sunday School, and then he's going to be preaching. He's going to be preaching about heaven and the hope of heaven and, and the fruitfulness of that. And so uh, we have that heavenly hope. You know, that's something that the devil can never take away from us when we're in Christ. But I want you to see a third thing that God gives us. He equips us to live a life that's pleasing to him, that's fruitful for him, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. I have shared this before, and I was telling myself, Rick, don't embarrass yourself again, but I'm gonna embarrass myself again anyway. Years ago, when I was a student at Hamden, Sydney, I had a uh, forest green Audi Fox, and uh, I would drive across campus. I was driving across campus the end of uh, class to go to basketball practice, and as I was making my way about halfway, the car just shut off, and uh, and uh, I, I walked the rest of the way. I called dad. My dad was the owner of Appomattox Truck and Tractor. I knew he had a flatbed truck. I knew he could take that car. And uh, I was talking to uh, Roma's dad just a few months ago. Rice Moore was the best mechanic in Appomattox. Her dad would have attested to it. We talked about Rice. And he happened to work for my dad. And so I knew Rice could fix anything. So they sent the flatbed truck. They took it up there. And the problem was it had run out of gas. <laughs> so, I mean, here's Rice Moore, the Michael Jordan of, of mechanics. And when I walk in about a week later, my head's like that. Now, in my defense, the, the gas meter was broken, all right? I'll just say that. I'll say that. Listen, we can't live the Christian life in our own strength. And the gas that God gives us is the power of his very presence. Now, follow what, what Pharaoh did. He said, I'm going to give you a lot of tasks, and I'm going to strip everything from you and see what you do. And he sat back like Jonah a few weeks ago, hoping they would fail so that he could rebuke them. That's not Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to call you to do it. And guess what? I'm going to give you my very presence that you can do it. You're not alone. You've got fellow believers. You've got the hope of heaven. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, work out your own salvation. But then he qualifies it and said, because it is, it is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good purpose. And here it says in verse 10, being strengthened with all power. We don't strengthen ourselves being strengthened carries the idea of the, the passive aspect of that verb, that the strength is given by God himself. He gives everything we need. But I want you to see a fourth and precious thing he gives us, not just the hope of heaven, uh, not just the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, not just fellow believers that help us, but he gives us the very word of God. The Bible that you have is a precious thing. Uh, someone has said that every other book you read, but the Bible reads you. And I can attest to it. Every day when I read it, it's reading me. And when we go to it, the Spirit of God that we just mentioned, that's the power of God, is a sword, that, that, that is a sword bearer that takes this sword, the Word of God, and it speaks to us. Here it says in verse 5 that He has given you the Word of truth, the gospel.
And through the gospel, you are saved. And through the gospel, you are kept. Do you realize that just as God saves you when you hear the gospel, it's that same gospel that keeps you. And the scripture says that it is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. The power of God to salvation for all who believe. All of these individuals who trusted Christ, 57 on Wednesday night in our community, every one of these individuals, there was something that was emphasized, and it's this. You need the Word of God in your life. Stay in the Bible. Apply it to your life. Fall in love with the words of God. You say, well, I don't know where to begin. There's some wonderful resources. We have little magazines, Journey. Uh, we have Our Daily Breads out there. I use them. Uh, you can start in reading. You can find somebody maybe that's been a Christian longer and say, how can you help me in studying the Bible and beginning to know more and more of, uh, about God? Hey, this is our plan. This, this is our guidebook. The Bible. And so God doesn't leave us alone. He gives us the word of God. But I want you to see a fifth thing. He gives us his plan. He tells us the plan. You know, what was a big part of it, Paul's prayer? He said, since the day we heard, we haven't stopped praying. He said that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. God is not a harsh taskmaster who doesn't inform those who are following him what he expects of them. Pharaoh, he had a plan, but he didn't care about the Jews. Jesus had a plan, and it says that he makes us more than servants. He makes us his sons. John 15, 15 tells us that. And so the word of God is not out there. The plan of God is not some obscure thing. If you will awaken in the morning and say, God, show me what to do today. You may not be a Billy Graham or a famous preacher, but God will equip you. He will give you the knowledge to do <coughs> what he's called you to do. In fact, it tells us in James that if you lack wisdom, pray to God who gives to all people generously and without reproach. In other words, God has a plan for your life. And God can give you the ability to know that plan. But I want you to see a final thing that he gives us. And it's this, right standing with God. Jesus shares in John 15 a profound thought. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master does, but I've called you friends. Pharaoh, those who served him weren't friends. Jesus said, my father said, you're not just a servant. You're a son. And a son shares in that. A son shares in it. And so God is not sitting here and looking at you as a Christian and saying, this person's just beneath me. I don't care. He is saying, I love this child so much. This child is one of my own. I love verses 13 and 14 of our text. It says, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. We think of the people who have been rescued from homes, maybe in hidden out places. Can you imagine how they felt when someone came, someone outside of them, and moved them from the domain of destruction into a domain that was secure? That is a physical picture of the spiritual picture of what God does for someone who moves from just living this world in this world and taking up oxygen to being a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a great transition from darkness to the kingdom. And how is it accomplished? Verse 14, we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, God takes you and he puts you in right standing with him. That's what God does for you so that you can live for him. You know, one of, in closing, one of my prized possessions uh, is a leaf backpack blower that my kids gave me three years ago um, for uh, Father's Day. They knew I needed it because they saw those times that I was trying to move those leaves. I love that thing. I get out there with it, even probably when I don't need to get out there uh, with it. In about three weeks, it's going to be very, va very valuable to me with all the oak trees in my yard, but we began that process. But you know, as I thought about that, 
I don't just have that backpack blower, but I have an electric blower in and around the house, my lawnmower that will mulch and move leaves. I have two rakes, a book of matches. I try to be very careful with them, <laughs> even a wheelbarrow. And my goal is by Thanksgiving, if the leaves fall soon enough, I can kick back and enjoy Thanksgiving in the month of December. All of these resources I have, to accomplish where I need to be in late November. God has given us all of these things. He's given us fellow believers, Christian. You're not alone. He, he's given you the word of God. He's given you the power to take that word, the Holy Spirit. He has given you a heavenly hope to encourage you. He's given you his plan. He, he lets you know that he has wonderful plans for you. He, he's given you right standing with God. All of these things. Aren't you thankful that he's not like Pharaoh? Aren't you thankful that when he calls us to things we can't do in our own strength, that he not only calls us, he equips us. So if you have trusted Christ this week, I want you to know you can do it. You can live this Christian life. You won't be able to do it in your own strength, and, and I look around here at Christians that have been here a while, and they would say, amen, you're going to stumble sometimes. You're going you're gonna to have difficulties. But by the grace of God, he picks you up, and he equips you, and he reminds you that you've got a hope, that you've got a hope of a bright future, and that will affect your presence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that, God, you have called us to live this Christian life, but you've not sent us out on our own, but that, Lord, you have given us the resources, the greatest of which is your very presence. You've given us prayer. You've given us the Bible. You have given us um, the power of your spirit. You have given us hope of a bright future. You have given us um, a, a plan. You have placed us in right standing. All of these things, Lord, you're for us. The word says, if you're for us, who can be against us? And so I pray for those in our church and in our community who have made this beginning of the journey of the Christian life, that you would encourage them and strengthen them to give them that life that is beyond a blessed life, even above, a life of purpose, a life of meaning, a life of joy. And we thank you that it comes only through Jesus Christ, and we lift this prayer in his holy name. Amen.